also in today's nightcap, I do a little bit more on cutting imperial threads on my metric Harrison lathe, um, cutting threads, but also disengaging the half nuts uh, during cutting the threads to make it easier to cut a thread onto a shoulder. Last week's nightcap, I did quite a lot on cutting an imperial thread on this metric Harrison lathe. I made a sweeping statement as well saying that you can't disengage the half nuts when you're cutting an imperial thread on a metric lathe or vice versa. This is not entirely true. You can't disengage the half nuts and then wind the carriage back to the beginning, but you can briefly disengage the half nuts just to give you enough time to get the tool out if you are cutting the thread up to a shoulder. Lots of people come on saying different ways of doing it and different things. Somebody sent us a link to Tom Lipton. I watch Tom Lipton. Tom Lipton's got an excellent channel. And Tom shows the process how it's done. I'm going to try and show the process as well. One advantage I've got with this lathe is it's got a clutch. So if I'm cutting a really coarse thread up to a shoulder, I can engage to cut the thread. If I disengage my clutch, it's got to break on and it stops straight away. So I can basically stop on a shoulder, then I can wind out and reverse the motor and get back to the beginning that way. If you didn't have a clutch, you have to try and stop the lathe and it takes time for the lathe to run down. No good. By the time it's stopped, your tool's gone too far. But the method I've been showing, or the method I'm going to show now, means that you can disengage your feed nuts, withdraw the tool, then reverse the lathe, and straight away you've got to get your nuts engaged back in on exactly the same point using your thread dead indicator. If you haven't got a thread dead indicator, you can use felt tip pen marks on your lead screw and on your gears and on your choke to get the same result. Right, so I'm going to basically try and demonstrate the way Tom Lipton demonstrated how he does it. But the first thing I need to do is touch the tool off onto the job. Just touch in there. Zero the cross slide at that. So that will be the tool just touching the job. I'll put a cut on a quarter of a mil. Right, the next thing is to engage the lead screw. I'm going to use a whole number. I'm going to use 120 all the time. So it's coming around. Hundred and twenty and engage at that. When the tool gets up to the shoulder, I'm going to disengage the half nuts there and stop the lathe. I disengaged the clutch, but you could simply turn the motor off. I'm going to zero the cross slide and wind it out one full turn. Right, you can see we've gone just past the 120. I'm going to reverse the motor on the lathe. Luckily I've got a clutch. If you didn't have a clutch, the carriage would start to go back now. So I'm going to engage my clutch, and then once the 120 gets lined up again with air, I'm going to re-engage the feed nuts. There. Right, so I know back to the beginning. Turn my, crump, my cross slide in, the one full turn, plus a bit for a cut. Turn the motor forwards again. Right, here's now running forwards. So if I engage the drive, which will be basically the same as turn the motor on, perfect, it's picked up the thread absolutely perfectly. I'll move the camera further back so you can watch the, the whole process like in one solid run, so to speak. Taking the cut over the shoulder. 
Linus disengaged, Rod is stopped, or clutch disengaged. Zero, wind it out. Reverse the motor. Then I've got to re-engage the feed nut on the same 120 mark, which is there. Back to the beginning again. Back to zero. A little bit of cut. Water forwards. That's picking up the thread perfect every time. So you can disengage the feed nut, but only very briefly. Right, we're in nice and close here. Start it up. That is picking the thread up absolutely perfectly. So disengage the feed nut, disengage the clutch or turn the motor off. Wind back out. Reverse the lathe. Start the lathe up again and engage the, the nuts on the 120, which is there. Back to the beginning. Back into zero. Plus some cut. Lathe forwards again. Engaged, perfect, absolutely perfect. That's another few mil taken off. That's probably about right. Half an inch, 12, 13 mil. That'll be the gap between the wall and the cylinder, that's the closest part of the outfit. These bits here I'll just need ground up because they're. Uh, Bit rough looking. Apart from that, that should do the job.
This is a quick look at what the crankcase is going to look like. Um, that's just, I've only got the one cylinder here. So that's one cylinder roughly in place. And this tabletop will be like the wall is, so it's just got a bit of clearance and a bit of a shadow gap between the casing. Reminds us of the Colosseum in Rome. So all told, that's 12 inches roughly to there. So it's going to be about four foot diameter altogether, the whole lot. It's going to take some pretty good bolts to keep it up there. It should look good. This is not the sort of work I try to get involved in. Uh, some stainless steel pipe work of a motorcycle uh, for a friend of a friend. I've been doing some welding on it. I've got to weld the ends of these exhaust cans up, sensor cans up. What I want to show you is this pipe here is a separate organ line. You need to put an organ purge inside the pipe. If you don't do that, you get what they call dingleberries on this side of the world, like a grey discoloration. You see my organ bottle here. I've got two flow meters on, one for the torch, and that one there supplies a flow of organ into the tube. The only tool doing this is you do use a lot of organ, but it's the only way to do it to get a satisfactory result. If the stainless pipe's really thick, you don't need to if you're not getting 100% penetration welds. But these welds are going all the way through. Anyway, I just thought I'd let you have a look at it. And you just use masking tape, or this is gaffer tape, just to seal the ends of the pipes off. And that's the gas feed into there. I've got a clamp and a nose for your chuck. And I've got a bit of copper welding cable onto my steel bench to make sure I get a good earth. Not too well, I've just done wrong there. Once it's polished up, it'll look quite nice. That's them all welded together in a quick polish. And that's my first and last motorbike exhaust like that. There's an awful lot of time in there. But it's still not bad for a mechanic that pisses about. Before I went on my holidays, I showed this travel dial. I swapped it for a, a clock gauge and a snake type mount. It was in a bit of a sorry state, it was very rough and notchy. The felt seal off here had been missing and it was obviously full of bits of swarf. Uh, it feels horrible inside there, horrible and notchy. I think what I may do with this, I'll give it to my friend Bob. Bob's a lad that repairs the, the dial gauges because this actually wants stripping and clean inside there as well. And I'm sure Bob will make a much better job of this than I possibly would. Bob's taken it apart, meticulously cleaned it, put it back together again. He's put a nice new felt seal under there. He's even gone to the extent of cleaning the label up and putting the label back on. Bob sent a series of pictures as he was doing it. I'm going to upload the pictures as well. Just so you can see what goes on inside of here. There's obviously a series of gears. And there's some very, very small ball race bearings. And the one that was the furthest away in here is the one that's had the, the, the least lubricant. And the little ball bearing had totally to collapsed, disintegrated. They're unbelievably small. They're like a pinhead, the actual balls. And what Bob did, he made a little conical brass bush to replace it. Anyway, it's come back. It's lovely and smooth. It's... Working great. Mainly has got a, a digital readout, a DRO, but I've always wanted a travel dial, and now I've got one. I'll have to make a nice bracket for it and get it mounted on the lathe. And the best thing about it is it's calibrated in thousands, which suits me just fine. Got a coarse calibration on here, and then thousands on there. Anyway, Bob, thanks once again, mate. It really is much appreciated.
once again, it's just time to say thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, and obviously a special thanks for all the well wishes that have come in towards Deb and towards my dad. And a massive thanks to Henning for making this fantastic model of a TARDIS, which I'm sure I'll be trying out. Deb's going to put it in the bedroom next to her on a little bedside table. Anyway, thanks very much. Much appreciated. Taken on Mike's lathe. But it wasn't taken on his lathe, it was taken on my camera, you bell end. <laughs>